welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. So today we have Dr. Gleb C. Porsky on the podcast. Dr. C. Porsky is passionate about promoting truth, rational thinking, and wise decision making. He's a tenure track professor at Ohio State, serves as the volunteer president of the nonprofit Intentional Insights, is a co founder of the Pro Truth Pledge, and the author of a number of books, most notably the number one Amazon bestseller, The Truth Seeker's Handbook, A Science Based Guide. Gleb, so nice to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Scott. It's a pleasure. So much to discuss. You really cover so many topics as I was trying to prepare for this podcast today. I was, <laughs> wow, like I didn't want to choose. <laughs> but Oh, we have to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And do you have any advice to people who might be overwhelmed with too many options in life? Let me start with that question. Have you studied that at all or looked at that? Yeah, there's a phenomenon, as probably both of us know, called decision fatigue, where when we are faced by too many options, we get really tired. So what I strongly recommend that people do is look at the most important options, choose the top five most important decision-making criteria, then evaluate the most plausible options in those decision-making criteria, and look at the one that comes out on top. You'll usually have one that comes out on top pretty quickly. I assume that you walk the talk, right? So you, pra you practice this <laughs> in your daily life. I do. You obviously, you, you think of yourself as you're a truth seeker, right? That's how you'd that probably conceptualize yourself as well. And are you constantly changing your worldview based on new evidence that comes in? Like, do you have a very flexible worldview? Absolutely. Uh, I tend to think of myself as having a relatively humble worldview nice. rather than flexible. So I have relatively low certainty on a number of things that people have high certainty about, that people tend to have high certainty about. So it's quite easy for me to change my worldview because I take a quite humble, deliberately humble position because we as human beings tend to be very overconfident about our knowledge. And I don't want to fall into that trap myself. I love that. So humility. So let me ask this question. Why do humans us messy humans tend to flinch from the truth. It's almost like we have a built-in aversion to it. We do. You know, from the perspective of what our minds are adapted to, our minds are adapted to the savannah environment. They're not adapted to the current modern contemporary environment. And in the savannah environment, it really was not very important for us to have the truth in order to survive. So we are not adapted and we're not optimized for evaluating reality clearly we're adapted for survival. So if we want to fit, it's much more important for us to fit along in, and conform to our tribe rather than get to the truth. So anything that goes against tribal impulses and intuitions would tend to cause us to go away from the truth. And anything that causes us to feel uncomfortable and threatened, and that's the fight or flight response, would cause us to go away from the truth. So both of those things, the fight or flight response, which is incredibly powerful, and tribalism, which is also incredibly powerful, both steer us away from the truth, unless we very actively try to get over the fight or flight response and get over the tribal response. And that's hard, and most people choose not to do that. A lot of people intentionally choose not to do that because they think that they're right. I mean, they think that they have a moral sort of some of them may be right, right? I mean, like, you know, some people have a certain uh, political opinion or value system and see it violated and get outraged. And I don't know, telling some people to, for them to maybe rely more on their rational faculties will actually just make them more mad, right? <laughs> Absolutely. There's a phenomenon called the backfire effect, where when we are presented with information that goes against our beliefs, we often stick more strongly to our current beliefs especially if it threatens our tribal sensibilities. So that's an example of what you're talking about. Now, there are many problems that result from us striving to win as opposed to go toward the truth. Many people, if you give them a, a real choice, if you look at their behaviors, it's a phenomenon called revealed motivations. What are they really looking for? 
Mm. you'll find that they're not really looking for the truth. You'll find they're looking to win for whatever goal they ch- they are pursuing, for whatever value set that they're pursuing. They don't optimize for the truth. They optimize for winning, however they interpret winning in any specific context, whether it's in a corporate setting, whether it's in a relationship setting or a political setting like you're talking about. Is winning tied up with power? Yes, so it can be tied up with power. It can also be tied up with relationships. So for example, if you perceive uh, some people, to them, relationships are the most important thing. For other people, power is more important. It depends what people are optimizing for. So often the tribal response where people want to fit into their tribe, that's more, the relationships are more important than individual power seeking. So interesting. Are you familiar with the cartoon that they have two lines, one line for inconvenient truths and another line for comfortable lies, two booths, and the line, yes. which line is much, much, much longer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I use that quite. I use that cartoon quite yeah. often in my public yeah. presentations. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an accurate and unfortunate statement about our society that we tend to prefer comfortable lies over uncomfortable truths. And as I mentioned before, because of tribalism and because of the fight or flight response, we have to deliberately be educated and taught to go against our intuitions. Otherwise, unless we are deliberately taught and choose to put in the effort to go against our instincts we will definitely choose the comfortable lies over inconvenient mm. truths. So, you know, your uh, work, as I was reading it, has some good, nice nuance. And you do talk about how we can go with our, sometimes it's okay to go with our gut in everyday life, right? So you're not making a blanket statement that we should all become Spocks, you know? <laughs> yes, Spocks Spock is actually a quite problematic figure because if you look, actually observe the show, if you look at the Star Trek he does do things based on emotions without realizing it, as do most of us. So most of the people who perceive <laughs> themselves as not having emotions actually are very strongly driven by emotions. An, an example, I was doing some consulting for an engineering uh, firm of about 200 people. I was talking to the HR vice president who brought me in to do the consulting. And I was talking to him about how to motivate engineers. And I asked him, I saw that he wasn't really using emotions to motivate engineers. And I said, hey, uh, so how are you integrating emotional motivation into getting engineers to do what you want? And he told me, hey, what, engineers have emotions? <laughs> and I was like, yes, you know, they may not show it, but they're very emotional. They're emotionally driven. So you need to think about emotions if you want to motivate them well to get uh, what the firm wants done accomplished. So what are some good examples of everyday life when we should rely on our gut? In dangerous situations, in situations of immediate danger, it's a good situ- It's a good situation to rely on our gut, partially because it resembles a savanna environment where the fight or flight response is going to be immediately present. You don't want to think too much when you're in the way of a moving truck. So <laughs> no thinking there, just get out of the way of the truck. Or if you see something flying at you from the you know, from the corner of your eye, that's a good time to duck. <laughs> so no need to think about that situation. That's one, uh, immediate danger. We face much less immediate danger than we intuitively think. Mm-hmm. We tend to make decisions way too quickly when we don't need to. So be careful when you're thinking about whether something is immediately dangerous. Your boss giving you constructive critical feedback is not a time to use your gut response. <laughs> 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 you know, it might feel dangerous, but that's not an actual physical danger. So that's one, actual physical danger. The second major one is with people who you know for a while, with whom you have close relationships, and that's the uh, tribal response. With people you know in a tribal situation for quite a while, Mm -hmm. you can trust your gut intuitions about them. You shouldn't trust your gut intuitions about people you just met because we tend to respond to people we just met as though they're from a hostile tribe. That's a really bad thing to do in our modern contemporary world. So, But with people you know for a while, if you see something is off with them, if you feel something is off with them, if you're somewhat uncomfortable with them, then that's a good time to trust your gut. So those are two big Wait. areas where you can trust your gut. Wait, so I, I want to understand that last one you said, because I can't tell you how many times I have felt something was a little off with someone, but once I gave them a chance or you know, I found out 99% of the time that either they were just having a bad day um, and particularly stressed, or some some of them were are just maybe have were just on the autism spectrum, and like you know just have a different way of seeing the world, and 
and I just gave them a chance, you know, I realized that it was a lot more innocuous than maybe a lot of people would have just immediately dismissed them. So, well, yeah, what do, you, what do you think of that? So that's the key thing, that if you know somebody well, that's why I was making that statement. Oh, okay. Some, okay. So if you know somebody well, then that's when you can trust your gut, relatively speaking. You're not always going to be correct. But if you know somebody well, you know, you'll, you'll know that that person's on the autism spectrum and how you should relate to that person. I see. Right. That's the tribal situation. We are adapted to read our tribal, our tribe members' sensations, feelings pretty well. That was really important for our survival in the savannah environment. So we are all the, the descendants of those who survived partially because they were able to be socially adapt within those environments. Now, we are not well adapted to read new people, people from outside our tribe. We tend to assume hostile intent, whereas that's almost much rarer the case than we would tend to imagine it is. That's a really good point. We project onto our supposed enemy all of our deepest fears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a oh boy. There's a, phenomenon, there's a phenomenon called the fundamental attribution error, one of the cognitive biases that results from Classic. us making Yep, where we tend to attribute people's behaviors to their personality, especially negative behaviors, rather than the context. And the context is usually much more important. So for example, when somebody cuts us off, you know, we tend to think, oh, what a jerk, that person cut us off. Now, when we cut somebody off because we fail to look in the mirror, we don't tend to think of ourselves, oh, I'm such a jerk. <laughs> we just tend to give ourselves a pass. We're like, oh, oops, didn't look in the mirror. That's a classic example of where we tend to make mistakes about other people by attributing to them negative perceptions, hostile intent, where that's not at all intended. Yeah. I really like that. So how can, what are some tips or ways we can recognize these thinking errors to prevent us, the, th the errors that prevent us from seeing reality more clearly? The most important way, the broad frameworks of for deductive thinkers who like broad frameworks is to notice whether the situation is similar to the savannah or not. Are, we in a, are you in a tribal relationship with this person? Do you have a close relationship with this person? If not, be suspicious of your gut, be suspicious of your intuitions. You'll be likely more hostile than you should. That's one. Now, if this person looks like you, has your cultural background, and looks like this person is a member of your tribe, you might actually have too much favorability, too much uh, positivity toward this person in comparison to what you should. That's called the halo effect. So that's one thing. The other thing is to delay your decision making. We tend to make decisions way too quickly, and we need to very deliberately delay our decision making and think about what decision we're making. Now, a third thing, just a very easy tip, is to make predictions about the future of your decisions. Predict what you anticipate the consequence to be and see whether you're right or not. And then calibrate yourself based on these predictions. All of us have some kind of mental errors based on our personality. So for example, I tend to be highly optimistic. I tend to think the, you know, the future will be bright, the grass is green on the other side. My wife on the other side, on the other hand, tends to be highly pessimistic. She tends to think the future will be bleak, you know, the grass is yellow on the other side. Well, the future so, will be bleak, isn't that true? <laughs> right, so sure, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So you need to learn, yeah, you need to learn where your cognitive biases are, okay. to which, where you are biased, the kind of problems that you experience, and making predictions about the future will help you calibrate yourself in the future and adjust for your personal biases. So is it possible to be perfect? It's never possible to be perfect, and that's not something we should ever strive for. Whew. We should strive to be better. Okay. We should always strive to be better than we were in the past, and that's definitely achievable. Being perfect is not really achievable of, because it's too high of a standard, and you'll just get depressed and sad and anxious trying to be perfect. <laughs> just constant, so it's okay, it's okay to be it's, – so it's still human to be biased every now and then. Oh, I mean – it's inhuman to not be biased. <laughs> I like that. I like that. We are humans and we are inherently biased because we're not adapted for the modern world. The only thing we can do is work on ourselves to address these biases slowly over time and become slightly less biased over a period of time. That's great. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. It's been a real labor of love. If you'd like to further support the podcast, 
I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make it a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review in iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Another thing you can do is donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. So thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. So are friends the enemies of wise choices? Friends can definitely be the enemies of wise choices. Wow. And so choose we... your friends wisely then? <laughs> Absolutely. Because of this tribal phenomenon, we are deeply influenced by our tribe in positive ways and negative ways. So for example, if we stop smoking, our spouse is about 60% more likely to stop smoking. Wow. And our close friends are about 30% more likely to stop smoking. The opposite applies if they start smoking and so on. So that's a clear example, and that's a good study. That's a clear example. There have been many similar studies where this phenomenon called network effects is really influential for us, where it highly shapes us in ways that we don't understand and we don't notice. The people who we, anticipate, who we perceive as our tribe really deeply influence us. So that's why it's important to choose friends wisely and make good choices about who we interact with. That means letting go of some relationships that aren't healthy for us as we develop and grow over time. Yeah, it's it's easier said than done. <laughs> just <laughs> just letting you letting your friends go. It's like okay, like setting them free. I yes. don't know. It's not it's that can be a tough. It can be tough, but you want to think about what's better for them and what's better for you. Are you good at that? You know, are you good at doing that? Like are you I'm do you have a, do you have a tactful decent. have you learned a tactful way of doing that? A tactful way of letting friends go. Oh, I would say... I mean, do you tell them? Do you tell them that you've let them go? <laughs> you... It's a good question. Uh, I tend to let it develop organically and naturally, depending on how and whether we find value in interacting with each other. And I generally tend to spend less time with those people with whom I love, find less value in interacting. And that's just a healthy way of developing, orienting over time to, in the future, spending less time with people whom you find less value with in interacting and who you want to be less like. So again, remembering that people who we are around deeply shape us, that makes it really important for us to spend time with people that we want to be like and not spend time with people who we don't want to be like. So for example, a lot of us, a lot of people tend to spend time with those they knew from high school or college or something like that. And that's often a bad idea because those people are tend to often not be the kind of people who we want to be like in the future. Yeah. I let go of the large majority of my high school connections. Oh, so. yeah. Because that's not that those people probably I want wise. to be like. <laughs> Right. And most of my college connections for the same reason. Those not people I want to be like. So it's a very good choice as you go through life to choose who you want the people with whom you want to have your relationships. And that's um, talking about relationships. Uh, new Harbinger will really be upset if I don't plug my new book for them, which I'm writing on relationships and cognitive biases. So FYI, everyone. <laughs> oh, so when will that be out? That will be out in March 2020. Oh, congratulations. That's uh, exciting. And so the focus will be on relation on social relationships? Yes, social relationships, of work relationships, community relationships, so all sorts of relationships. And all the biases we have in relationships. What a neat uh, conjunction of things, biases and uh, and relationships. I really like that. Well, I look forward to reading it, and maybe you can come on again. <laughs> Absolutely, I'd love to. In 2020, 2020 is going to be an interesting year politically, too. <laughs> yes, it will be. It will be. Let's talk about politics now. Uh, you have a whole bunch of sure. stuff you've written about it, and I'm like, I'm looking forward to talking to you in 2020 about how about we have a chat like the day after the election? <laughs> sure. Happy to do that. <laughs> yeah, that'll be, fun. and then we can kind of see how things maybe have changed. Mm -hmm. So here's some questions. What's the worst problem in politics? I'm just going to straight up ask you this. 
Gosh, the worst problem in politics is irrationality. People are deeply irrational about their decision making. They make choices based on their gut reactions, like we talked about, the tribal responses and the fight or flight response, rather than making choices based on what's good for themselves and what's good for their country in the long term. So they are not seeing the truth of reality and making really bad choices that really harm them and people around them in the long term. And that's really dangerous for our future as a country. And it's causing right now, as we see from the current political climate, it's causing not simply increasing polarization, but fundamentally undermining the institutions that have made America great in the past. Mm, America has been great <laughs> at one point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, America was definitely source of light and leadership for democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of uh, expression in the world in the past. Not so much now, unfortunately. Big unfortunate, yeah. So, you know, let's talk about a future with Trump. <laughs> You know, we don't tend to talk about the uh, politics on the psychology podcast, but I think we can keep this conversation actually apolitical and analytical. You know, you say with Trump, you say that there's a kind of a distinction we need to embrace truth versus comfort. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Can yes. you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So for people who are supporting Trump or for people who are opposing Trump, it's important to establish and evaluate the distinction between what's comfortable and what's accurate. So, for example, a lot of people might who support, who don't support Trump, who oppose Trump, might not like to hear that the economy is doing really surprisingly well for many of them under Trump. But it's an accurate and truthful statement that you can look at the data and see that, okay, the economy is doing really, really well under Trump. Now, people who support Trump might uh, not like to hear that he makes a lot of false statements. He makes a lot of deceptive statements that are very clearly deceptive. Lots of people, Republicans, themselves say that he makes a lot of deceptive statements. And that really hurts the country, the credibility that the office of the presidency has, the credibility that the United States has in the eyes of the world as a whole has greatly decreased. And that is visible through polling and through a lot of social science mechanism where you can effectively, clearly recognize that that's what's happening, and that's undermining the institutions of the country. The things that we talked about has made America great in the past in the eyes of the world. So you might support Trump and at the same time recognize the truth of this is happening right now. So that this is an important way to make a distinction between regardless of how you feel about Trump, you can recognize if you don't like him that there are some things that are going on in the country that are positive. And if you do like him, you can recognize that there are some things going on in the country and in the world that are negative. You know, you're talking about this so objectively, like kind of like a computer who's analyzing things <laughs> from, from afar. Like, do you personally have any political convictions or do you just really like thinking about everything really like, as objectively oh, as possible? I have very strong political okay. convictions and I vote and yeah. it's, you know, I have very strong feelings. I can also very clearly differentiate between the truth and my personal values. Really? Those are two different things. Oh, wait, that's Absolutely. really, that's a truly interesting distinction. So, yes, you, those so are, those you can are hold two both things in your, Absolutely. I mean, that's a sign, that's a good sign of intelligence, I would say, to be able to, <laughs> no, seriously, that's, that, that's not easy. It's not easy to hold yes. both in working memory, especially when they're inconsistent. Yes, it, it is very it is very hard, you know, and whether I support Trump or I'm not going to talk about whether I do or don't, sure. but both I made both points earlier that you can have, you know, support Trump and still believe that there are some problems and oppose Trump and still believe that there are some benefits. And that's a number of, that is something that we all should strive for in order to be truth seekers, to be able to recognize that there's a difference between personal values and the truth of reality. That's a very fundamental way that we should be as real citizens of the country who recognize what is best for the country, what is best for our society as a whole, rather than a partisan position, what is best for an ideology or our tribe. I mean, in an ideal world, our values would be extraordinarily truthful. They'd be all, everything would be aligned. Truth, goodness, and beauty would be one. <laughs> Oh, I actually disagree with you, Scott. I think that that's not a world that can be possible. Oh, we I always say it's possible. 
right. I said in an so, ideal world, but it doesn't mean it's I, possible. I wouldn't even. There are no. There are things that are separate from truth. So, for example, do you? You know, one can value um, family values. You know, a traditional family, mm-hmm. or one can value uh, gay marriage. Those are not about truths. Those are about values. What do you value? Oh. You can value this or you can value that. Now, you can also observe that uh, children who grow up in gay families turn out really well, according to the social science research. So that's an accurate statement according to the research. Doesn't matter whether you support traditional families or whether you support or whether you, you know, you're for gay families or not. You can also say, uh, looking at family research, that children who grow up in single parent homes don't do so well. And that's another sort of statement that you can say, according to the social science, the psychology research, that's what happens. Single parent homes tend to be worse than homes with gay parents, with two parents of the same sex, of the same gender. So that's a that's another sort of statement you can make and say, this is by, backed by the research. I can, I can personally appro- uh, appreciate traditional families or I can appreciate gay families, but this is all what the science says. So we can separately hold value positions and separately hold truthfulness positions. Well, where do you get, how do you derive your values personally? Gosh, my personal values. Where I does mean, it come from? Part of my, oh, that's my, part of, for me personally and for everyone, it comes from their background, their culture. Their temperament, what, personality. Their temperament, I mean, a bunch of this is genetic, as you know, that. Uh, our genes determine a significant subset mm-hmm. of our values. Mm-hmm. So, for example, people who have a strong repulsive response tend to be more likely to be conservative. A and strong people what response? Repulsion. Oh, disgust. Yeah. Yeah, response. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Jonathan Haidt's so, research. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, and there's a bunch of other stuff. So, a lot of this is genetic. Maybe about 40 to 50 to 60 percent is genetic. A lot of it is about our personal experience and so on. And values are not about truth. It's just what we uh, hold as a value, what our personal ideology. That's separate from what is well, the fact about reality. I think that you're you're abnormal, <laughs> in the sense that I do think Thank that you. most people. Yeah, I, I do mean that as a compliment, obviously. But I think most people do not have that capacity or the inclination to hold those things separate in their working memory. And I think that, and maybe it's this is a problem. It seems to me like most people automatically equate their value system with the universal truth, which is what gets us into these kind of tribal wars. Would you agree with that? You're absolutely right. And what research on this topic shows is that the more education someone has, especially in the liberal arts, the more capable they are of holding the difference between values and truths. So people who are more educated tend to be more capable of this. It's a matter, in other words, of education. As, I, as we talked about before at the beginning of the program, the difference in between tribalism, yeah. it, you can be tribal, and uh, that tends to overwhelm truthfulness. And fight or flight response also tends to overwhelm truthfulness. However, education, training in critical thinking, this is what critical thinking is about, rational thinking, evaluation of reality, can help us overcome these things. And this is crucial for us, not simply in political settings, but let's say in personal company, corporate corporate settings. If we are not able to overcome our impulses, we'll make really bad decisions for in business settings. That's a, a clear example. If we're not able, there's a reason so many people lose money in the stock market because they sell, uh, they sell low and buy high. Whereas experienced investors know that they should sell high and buy low. It's a really hard thing to do, which is why most people aren't able to make money in the stock market. We can go into a number of other examples where not being oriented toward uh, overcoming your gut reactions <laughs> harms you in life in very many ways. Also, you talk about you know how we can stop losing money and invest wisely. Yes. Yeah. So we can stop losing money and invest wisely by not trusting our intuitions. That's a really important one. So we can invest we can invest wisely by thinking about where uh, do we by thinking about uh, the difference between ETFs and stocks. We talked about selling low uh, versus right. selling high. That's a clear one. Now, a good way of making stock investments is to invest in the broad stock market 
market mm -hmm. and especially into exchange traded funds. So that's what I talk about in the article. Look for exchange traded funds, which include a lot of stocks, not simply one stock, which can go up or down. For example, if you are recently invested in the mattress firm, you'd be wiped oh. out mostly because the mattress firm not, went bank. Not only that, but I had a mattress firm bed, and when I saw they're about to go bankrupt, I, I oh. returned it <laughs> <laughs> before they went bankrupt, and I'd never be able yeah. to ever get a warranty. Go. Yeah, good idea. Absolutely. <laughs> So that's, that's an example. You don't want to be invested in one stock, and you don't want to be invested in a mutual fund. Here's why many people are invested in mutual funds, and that's a big problem. Uh, let me explain why. Mutual funds are actively traded by stock traders who say, hey, we, are, we have made a lot of money in the past. You should trust us. You should go with us. Well, let's, let's have a thought experiment. Let's think that there are 100,000, uh, let's imagine there are 100,000 stock traders, and they're trading just purely based on luck. 50% up, 50% down. So in one year, you'll have 50,000 stock traders who have had a good year and 50,000 who had a bad year. In another year of those who had a good year, the 50,000, you'll have 25,000 who had a good year and 25,000 who had a bad year. Now fast forward to 10 years, you'll have 50 remaining who had a decade of good years. They simply unlock alone. Now what will happen? Those will be the gurus of the new uh, stock market. They'll be appearing on CNBC, Fox yeah. Business, you know, Inc. Company, Wall Street oh, yeah. Journal saying, these are the people you should go with. And they just succeeded based on luck alone. So you'll be giving them your money. <laughs> and next year, you'll have a completely blind chance of luck, whether you'll be your money will be up and your money will be down, and they'll be taking a high commission. You don't want to do that. That's why the vast majority of exchange the vast majority of actively traded funds mutual funds are a bad idea exchange traded funds etfs are not actively traded you just invent in a certain you just invest in a certain industry or the broad stock market and you have very low payments on that percentage so that's a, the best idea to invest for people who are not highly actively traded Wow, you just gave that advice for free uh, do you realize there are people who would have <laughs> kept that under a paywall <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm helping make your show more popular. <laughs> so I don't mind. <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm just, I'm saying thank you. You're welcome. Let's pivot back to politics just for a second, because you write some things that I thought were quite provoking, thought provoking. Mm -hmm. So why should the mainstream media be careful when they criticize conservatives? So mainstream media often criticizes conservatives or Democrats, but in this case conservatives more recently, with a broad brush. And that's a big problem when you criticize people with a broad brush, because there's that, in pol that's the, there's that immediate tribal response by people who are identify as conservatives. They, when they see the mainstream media criticizing conservatives, saying Republicans more broadly, that's a big problem. Now, let's go to the Kavanaugh nomination, which just occurred. So very recently occurred Kavanaugh nomination. When you see op-eds, which I read in the New York Times and the Washington Post, they were very broadly saying Republicans did this, Republicans did that, you know, the Republicans are a problem when they were criticizing the behaviors of Republicans. Whereas there are a number of individual Republicans who did not behave in ways that the newspapers described. And now, but if you're criticizing Republicans, people who identify as Republican will say, you're criticizing me. Not criticizing a group of 50 or 49 Republican senators. You're criticizing all Republicans. So that's an example of why it's a problematic idea to paint all conservatives with a broad brush. I was specifically referring to an example, a uh, historical example of when that happened, when um, a Senate, when someone who's currently a congressman body slammed a journalist and all Republicans were criticized for, oh, how the Republicans are attacking the media. And that's just not true. There are many of Republicans who are not attacking the media. Um, but that creates a tribal response, which is really harmful for the future of our country and for trust in the media. So that's why I strongly recommend media to not criticize conservatives with a broad brush. It sounds like the same logic would apply in the other direction as well. You know, just so, let's not paint anyone with a broad brush. You know, Republicans love painting Democrats with a broad brush as well. <laughs> so, that's, um, that's a better idea as well. I was yeah. giving a specific example with the media painting yeah. a specific Republican, saying that that's the way all Republicans act, which is not true. Yeah. The same with the with Democrats who are targeted 
by Republicans saying that all Democrats act in a certain way, and that's, that's just not true. Now, let's think about who that benefits. That most benefits people on the edges, on the polls in both parties, because it creates more polarization. So people are pulled to the polls, and the country grows further divided. We oh, have yeah. greater partisans rather than pulling toward the middle, having a stronger center and having more care and concern for the future of our country rather than the polls of each party. It doesn't seem like we're moving in that direction right now. Oh, no, it does. So here's a potentially controversial question, uh, which I never shy away from on my podcast. Um, what's the one thing Trump got right in Charlottesville? The one thing Trump got right in Charlottesville, that's an article I wrote that also got me in some hot water with some <laughs> liberals, was that he accurately pointed out that there was violence on both sides. And that's a big problem that a lot of liberals were not able or willing to accept that the Antifa, the people who were fighting the Nazi, fascist, whatever, people on the alt-right, engaged in some provocative, aggressive violence which was actually documented by Antifa themselves proudly afterward, where they were saying that they aggressively pursued with violence some people on the alt-right in Charlottesville. And that's really important to acknowledge and uh, accept. There was, according to documented evidence, quite a bit more violence on the alt-right side, on the side of the right in that case in Charlottesville. But we can't simply ignore or sweep under the rug the violence on the left, on the far left, and the Antifa. And that's an example of being, of orienting toward truthfulness, regardless of where your values are. So you can see, you know, I personally really don't like the far right. I don't like Nazis. I wouldn't say the far right, I'd say Nazis. That's, a, I have a big problem with them. I think they're very bad for, the, for America as a country. Really? I think they're but, great. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I respectfully agree. disagree with you. Well, well, I respectfully disagree with you, and we'll have to agree to disagree. <laughs> By the way, I'm, for the listeners who don't know me, I'm joking. You have to say that these sure. days, you know? Yes, yes. As if your last name doesn't indicate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a very self loathing Jew. But anyway, go. anyway, go on. Anyway, so uh, it's very important to uh, identify accurately that there are some people on the far left who engaged in aggressive, provocative violence and to say, OK, we can identify them and we could say that those are tactics, whether you personally agree with them or disagree with them, you have to acknowledge that those are tactics that occurred for the sake of truthfulness, because otherwise you can't have a healthy conversation with people on the other side. If you can't acknowledge the problems in your own, on your own side, then how can you engage effectively with people on the other side? Yeah, well, I'm right on board with you. and I. I'm just loving this distinction you're making between facts and values. And it's just, it's kind of blowing my mind in a way because it's beautiful. It's just so clear to me now that we need more of that. That's what we're lacking. And I hadn't articulated it in that way. So thank you for, I love it when my mind gets expanded on this podcast. That's why I do this. <laughs> so how can you talk to people who deny the facts? So there are a couple of ways. The most important thing that you want to focus on and what I talk about is a strategy called EGRIP, Emotions, Goals, Rapport, Information, and Positive Reinforcement. First of all, you have to understand why people are denying the facts. We talked about the tribal response, the tribalism and the fight or flight response. The underlying components in all of that is emotions, gut intuitions. So you have to understand what kind of emotions are going on with a person that are causing that per person to deny the facts. What's driving them? So that's the first thing you have to understand. Then you need to understand what that person's goals are. Why is that person denying the facts? So for example, why are people on the far left, the, on the left denying the facts about far left Antifa violence in Charlottesville? What's going on there? What are their goals in doing so? Then you need to establish rapport with them. You need to show them that their goals are your own. So for example, I can agree with them that people on the far right in the Nazis specifically, not all far-right people, but Nazis, we can both agree that they are highly problematic for the future of America, that that's a really dangerous trend to go. So we can establish that report. Once we establish that report, I can give some information that now we can bring in facts. We should not lead with the facts. Leading with the facts is going to be quite dangerous 
dangerous if we want to prevent defensive or aggressive responses from people on the other side. And again, defensive or aggressive responses are a consequence of the fight or flight response and tribalism, that people want to defend themselves or they want to attack you. So to prevent that, you want to first do the four, do the previous three sides before you bring in the information. And that's the eye of the egret. So you bring in information and you say, hey, in order to have conversations with people on the other side, we need to acknowledge the problems, the challenges on our side. And that includes the, in, the provocative, aggressive violence of the Antifa. So if you want to convince other people to collaborate with you effectively, people on the other side, you need to acknowledge the problems on your side. And once they agree with this, this a statement that's obvious on the face of it, you want to give them positive reinforcement. That's the P part. Say, okay, it's great that we can agree. I, I understand that this was not an easy thing for you to acknowledge that the Antifa engaged in aggressive, provocative violence. But this, it was really important that we did so in order to have these healthy conversations with people on the other side. So that's the kind of progress you want to make through the EGRIP technique, emotions, goals, rapport, information, and positive reinforcement. I'm going to try to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Try to remember the acronym. So that's cool. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm originally from Eastern Europe, a small republic, a small country called the Republic of Moldova. Now, my, it's uh, just to the south, uh, east of Ukraine and west of Romania. Okay. It was liberated in 1991 from the from the Soviet Union, from Russia, whatever. What's now Russia? It was conquered in 1945 by the Soviet Union and then added to that territory. And so my parents left in 1991 when it was liberated. And I was a 10-year-old kid when they left and then wow. grew up in New York City, lived in Boston, North Carolina, and now I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. Wow. What were you like as a kid? Were you really curious? <laughs> I mean, I imagine you were a very curious and intellectual I was definitely curious and intellectual. I was quite less self-aware and quite a bit less humble, much more intellectually aggressive, I would say. Yeah, like you wanted things to be precise, right? I wanted things right. to be precise and I wanted, uh, I was really concerned when they weren't. I was yeah. Yeah. much more inclined to see both sides of the debate yeah. than other people. And that got me yeah. in a lot of hot with people on my uh, quote unquote yeah. my side yeah and that would still get you in hot trouble in this political climate you have to, everyone wants yeah. you to take a, if you're not taking someone's side they don't like you exactly yeah so the thing about the charlottesville that got me in a lot of trouble with people yeah, who I can see that. were similarly agreed with me on the problem with nazis are a problem but weren't willing to acknowledge the the antifa violence i mean my background also is Jewish, so that got me in a lot of trouble, particularly with people in my contact network who are also Jewish. So, you know, I also know, and if this is too personal, please tell me, I know that you battled mental illness for some yes. part of your life, and you've escaped it, as you've said. Uh, you know, you, you've escaped that darkness. So how did you kind of call your way out of that? So there are... It was difficult to really acknowledge at first when uh, mental illness occurs. It's not intuitive to see from within that mental illness is occurring and that it's yeah. time to seek help. So it was really important for me to get an outside perspective. First of all, to acknowledge that something is really wrong. I'm not able to function n normally as regularly as I should, not to be motivated, not to be able to engage in important activities, and then to be able to go and find a therapist for help. So that was really important for me to be able to make that, have that understanding. And the important thing to remember is that the brain is an organ just like any other organ, and we tend to forget that. We tend to identify our brain with ourselves. We would be much more likely to seek help if we had a stomach problem or you know, if we broke our arm. Rather than if we broke our brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a really, good, so, it's a really good point. Yeah. Did do you have yeah, depression? So, yeah. So depression, anxiety, and in order to address that, it was really important to have the recognition that I'm not able to function as I normally. Yeah. Am, as I know, you know. And so I went to a therapist for a while for a weekly, and then eventually. So every week for a couple of years, several years, then started taking medications as well, psychiatric medications, 
right now I'm seeing a therapist monthly, but still taking uh, psychiatric medications. Cool. Well, it sounds like you've really come a long way. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Still suffering from quite a bit of anxiety occasionally, but not so much yeah. depression. Yeah. Yeah. Me and you both, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in this day and age, if you're not anxious, you're not conscious. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But right now, I'm much more capable of noticing when I'm experiencing anxiety yeah. and uh, taking deliberate steps to address it. Good. And uh, I've personally found that meditation has helped me leaps and mm. bounds. For me too. I yeah. try to meditate daily. Yeah, I try to. Um, so how can we defend our happiness against emotional traps? It seems that question is related to mental illness or anxiety. Yes. So yeah. one way to sure. One way that we can defend our happiness against emotional traps is recognizing when these emotional traps are occurring when we're driven by our gut responses and intuitions to make bad decisions. And that was a chapter of a book that I talked about choosing a house, how we chose our house of my wife and I. So what, what we went, the process through which we went in order to choose a house. We went to this house. It had a great, it was in the summer. It had a great, beautiful backyard and there was a lot of shade and we were really uh, struck by it. And so that's really fascinating, really great house. And we were going to choose it. And then there was a second runner-up, but we decided to not uh, just go with our intuitions. It was a pretty major life decision. And what we did was we evaluated by a quantitative mechanism, which I can describe right now, how we chose the house. What we did was we evaluated each part of the house, including the backyard, but also the kitchen, you know, the bathrooms, the living room, and so on, by its importance to us and the quality of it. So importance is basically the weight of it, how weighty it is, how important it is. And we placed a number on that from uh, 1 to 10. And the quality of this room. So how good are the bathrooms? How good is the kitchen? How good is the backyard? One thing we realized was that we would not be using the backyard year-round. We would only be using it for half of the year. So that made the backyard only five, a ranking of five out of 10. Whereas, uh, let's say, the living room we would be using year-round. So I think we ranked something like at nine. Hmm. And uh, when we added up everything, the other house, the one we thought was going to be a runner-up, not the one with a great backyard, turned out to be quite a bit better on this mm. scale. And so we really protected ourselves from a great deal yeah. of unhappiness by using wow. this weighted rank decision-making method. And so we live in this, we've been living in this house where I currently am uh, for about two years, and we are very glad that we made this decision, even though the backyard is not as awesome. Wow. Well, I bet there's many aspects of you that your wife fell in love with, you know, <laughs> including your quirky personality, you know, your compassion, your big heart. But also it's obvious that you have such a, um, you know, you help the family make the best decision. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, that, that's, that, that's really important. And yeah. uh, it's something I really strive to do, yeah. to focus. Uh, and we yeah. collaborate together, my wife and I. On this. Uh, yeah, I saw a really nice picture of you two. Yeah, in one of your materials that you sent me. So tell me a little about this pro-truth movement that you're kind of spearheading. Mm -hmm. So the pro-truth movement is an effort to get everyone around the world to commit to certain clear, truthful behaviors. Now, let's talk a little bit about the concept of truth. It's a very fuzzy concept if you think about it. You know, whose truth is it? My truth, your truth. It's very fuzzy. We can argue about it to no end. Who, you know, whose truth is it? Instead of arguing about truth with a capital T, Let's focus on behaviors. Let's focus on truthful behaviors. In the same way that if you go to a doctor and he tells you to eat healthy, it doesn't mean to eat healthy. It could mean a thousand different things to a thousand different people. If he gives you a clear set of behaviors, that's much more helpful for you to follow. Yeah. So the yeah, the pro truth movement, which is the, the basis of it is the pro truth pledge at protruthpledge.org, is a set of simple 12 clear, simple behaviors that anyone can follow. So for folks who are following along on their online, just go to the, the protruthpledge.org website. So again, that's P-R-O-T-R-U-T-H-P-L-E-D-G-E.org. And you can check out these 12 behaviors. They are, I'll give you a couple of examples. Fact check information to confirm it's true before accepting it or sharing it. Cite my sources so that others can verify my information. Reevaluate if my information is challenged and retract it if I can't. Align my opinions and my actions with facts. 
ask people to retract information to reliable sources have disproved, even if those people are my allies, and celebrate those who retract incorrect statements and update their beliefs toward the truth. And six more behaviors like this. Very simple, very clear behaviors. Trying to take that... notes. You're talking too fast. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's all at pro, it's all at pro truth pledge that org. So yeah, all of these very simple, very clear behaviors that are fundamentally important, that are the essence of critical, rational thinking and media literacy. So just committing to these behaviors, taking the pledge, is what we want folks to do. Cool. Well, I'll put that in the show notes so people can go to that. Yeah, we have a number of prominent people who took the pro truth pledge, including four U.S. Congress people, over 30 state legislators, and prominent individuals like Peter Singer, Steven Pinker, Jonathan Haidt. We mentioned Jonathan Haidt earlier in the show, uh, Michael Shermer, and many others. Who uh, Chip Heath is a famous psychologist who took the pro truth pledge. Many other organizations as well took the pledge, and over 8,000 ordinary folks. Wow, you just made a distinction between height and ordinary folks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, well, you know, I want to ask one last question. How can you live the life you want to live? I think that's a good ending question here. The most important thing to do in living the life you want to live is making sure that you're not letting your gut intuitions drive you into making really bad decisions for yourself. Now, think about the example I gave just be five minutes before before about the house. If we chose that house, we'd be having quite a bit of a worse life than we have right now because we just let our gut intuitions drive us and make cause us to make bad choices. If I didn't look at objectively at the fact that I needed some mental health support, I'd be still having quite a bit of struggle with depression than I am right now. And there are so many other choices in our fin- we made some examples of financial investments where if we made poor financial investments, sold uh, low and bought high, we'd be having much worse lives. The most important thing to do in having the life that you deserve, the life that you want to live, is to make sure that you are able to notice when your gut intuitions are not aligned with reality and make choices that are aligned with reality. Otherwise, you will not have the life you want. And that's really bad for you. And I really don't want you to suffer. (laughs) That's what's driving me here. I mean, seriously, my goal set, my value set is utilitarian. My, I want people to not suffer. And that's what's really driving all of my activism. That's, wow. I want the most good for the most number. That's, that's, that's what I want. You want your value there to be aligned with the truth. You want them to actually not suffer in reality. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much for chatting with me today, Gleb, and for the great work you're doing. Thank you, Scott. And I hope you yourself consider taking the approach of Pledge. We have a number of psychology podcasters who did so and I welcome you to be one of them. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned like a list of guests on the show. <laughs> you're right. You're right. <laughs> yep. You're right. I will absolutely consider it. I'm, I'll check it out later tonight. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. You have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard. I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of The Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.